Great. Okay, right. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for those of you that I've not met before, my name's Joanne Wright and I work in the Support and Information Service alongside my colleague Louise Kirby, who on my screen is sat to my left. Um, before we start, there's just a few housekeeping points. Um, you've all joined on mute, and if you could just keep muted while Charlene's talking, because it cuts down on background noise. Um, we'll also be recording this webinar so that we can upload it to our YouTube channel so people can catch up with it at a later date. So if you don't want your image to be seen, just keep your videos turned off. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask Charlene some questions at the end of her talk. And the way we've done this in the past, and it works quite well, is if you just put a note in the chat box that you'd like to ask her a question, and then I will personally invite you to put that question to um, Charlene um, when she's finished her talk. Uh, so I'll just now hand you over to Louise, who will uh, give the introduction. Thanks, Jo. So today we're joined by Charlene Young for a very personal webinar about Charlene's experiences of receiving an osteosarcoma diagnosis in 2011. Charlene was actually scheduled to come and talk at our conference in June in Watford. So this seemed like the next best thing to get her online and, you know, give her, give her that chance to speak. So we know the impact as a charity of being diagnosed with a rare cancer like primary bone cancer is irreversibly life changing for so many people. And for Charlene, she also felt the effects of being told that she had bone cancer as a black woman. So since opening up about all that she has and continues to face, Charlene has become an accomplished public speaker and an ambassador of Black Women Rising, a black Asian minority ethnic cancer support group and community in South London. So we really, really do feel privileged to have Charlene here today. Um, we sort of said on Monday to set the record straight and to kind of give her the chance to talk unplugged on issues that she has faced relating to race and health when she has faced her primary bone cancer journey. So thank you so much Charlene and I'll now hand over to you. Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to get to share my story on this platform again once again with you guys um i'm just going to talk i haven't prepared anything um that's not my way of doing things um i'm just gonna uh, do a free flow and um just try and share it in the best way that i can before diagnosis um as louise said i was 27 years old i had a five-year-old at the time i was working in child care i was having a pretty good life to be honest very active person i've never been a much of a homebody so you know outdoors was my thing so um when i was working during the summer i noticed that i couldn't run around with the children and do what i usually do and it was a bit odd for me so I thought, okay, let me go to the GP. I went straight away and they said to me, um, see how it goes, here's some painkillers, come back if there's any, you know, if it continues. So I think I went back the same week or the week after because there was no change. It was it felt like it was getting worse. So um, I went back immediately and um, they referred me straight to the hospital. So I went straight down to the hospital, I think it was that day, and went for an x-ray, which at the time I thought it was a fracture. I thought I must have banged it or something, but just didn't realise. So I went straight to the um, hospital, had x-rays, and um, I think at that point they sent me, they didn't give me the results, which was a bit strange, but then they, they sent me over for a biopsy. And at the time, I didn't know what a biopsy was, and I don't think I Googled it neither, but I just remember the following week being in Stanmore, having a biopsy in a private room, private part of the hospital, and um, it was very quick. It was all very quick, but again, I didn't question anybody. I didn't question the process in my mind. I just thought it was a fracture. So. Um, 
I think after the biopsy, a few days later, I got invited back to um, Stanmore Hospital in um, in Bolsover Street in London. So um, I went there with my mum. Again, I didn't question why am I here? What does this hospital specialise in? Because I never even heard of this hospital. So it was a bit strange. But again, I didn't question it. So me and my mum went and there was a two nurses there and a doctor in my mind I was just thinking it's a bit odd um and he was really nice my um doctor really nice and he just explained that you know you've got an osteosarcoma and I didn't know I've never heard of that word in my life um so he he was so nice he broke it down and to be honest, when he mentioned the bone cancer, I completely didn't remember anything else he said after that. I I shut off immediately. I all I just all that kept going through my mind was, I'm gonna die. Especially saying it's a rare cancer. And I'm just like, how many people survive a rare cancer these days? And my mum was with me. My mum's not um as vocal as me so i don't actually remember her even asking any questions like i said i just sh completely shut off um i just remember going home crying i don't even remember how i got home i remember i, get, I got home and i was in tears and i just i, I was totally devastated I called a few family and close friends and immediately from one person I got a negative reaction and I feel like that's what kicked it off for me. Um, I was meant to go to work the next day and this person said to me, no, you're not going to work. No, you're, you're not staying at home. You're coming to work. And this is a family friend that I've worked for for a long time and you know this is the reaction i'm getting and i'm in tears and i'm telling you i've got cancer so that all that automatically triggered off a negative reaction in me because automatically i felt like i can't tell anybody else because if this is what i'm gonna get i'd rather not so um so yeah i told my close friends and family and um they was devastated also i didn't know what to say um majority was so supportive um in in handling and speaking to me about it um from then on medically i had x-rays mri scans um it was a lot going on so my operation was in the next few weeks and um again i wasn't told what how my life was going to change i wasn't explained nothing about day-to-day -day, um rehabilitation um and i think these are the things that made my experience more traumatic um i was given don't get me wrong my you know my nursing team the surgeons they were great you know they the knowledge that they had within you know bone cancer itself was amazing but i just felt like it wasn't tailored to me and my situation and um so i yeah so i was just given a bunch of leaflets basically and on my way i had the operation i'm out of london i'm by myself I'm on a cancer ward. The isolation was immense. Um, even now I get nightmares about the ward and hearing people screaming out for pain. You know, that type of thing kind of stays with you. And it was traumatic because again, I was by myself. Um, no one to talk to. I didn't want to burden my family because they didn't 100% get it. And um, they're already dealing with enough. And I'm a bit like my mom. We kind of um, 
we kind of just get on with it and that's exactly what i done um, without realizing that no charlene actually you do need support which i'll later on tell you a bit about that but for mental health so um so yeah i had my operation and um I was on about 15, over 15 medications for the day, um, three times a day. I didn't get any chemo and I didn't get radiotherapy. That was something that they didn't know if they'll give to me or not. They wanted to kind of see how it goes. Um, one of the things I had to deal with as well was that because I didn't have chemo, I'm okay. And actually, it wasn't okay. I had to deal with the same effects of, as chemo. I was housebound. I couldn't walk. Um, at this point, I'd given up mentally because I had no desire. I felt like I was kind of left to it. So I just couldn't help myself. Um, physically, I couldn't help myself. And um, it was a place that I've never been before. It's, this wasn't me. And, you know, my son was five. And I know he kept, obviously, he kept seeing me like this. You know, why is mommy in the room? And we're not going out. You know, just things like that. Um, I worried about, um, as well as dealing with what I'm dealing with. So um, i done a lot of physio. Eventually, I've done a lot of physio. Um, at this time, when I was unable to get around a lot, I felt like I belonged to the hospital. Um, my only outside was the hospital. I felt like their property. I felt like everything was medical, jargony, and there was nothing in there about mental health. You know, it was just all about the knee. Um, so I don't think I explained. I had a knee replacement. I had a full knee replacement. So what they done, the cancer was in the bone and they removed half of um, my thigh bone and half of my, I think it's the tibia, the lower leg bone, which is all replaced with metal now. And um, I think it's quite funny when they say to me, oh, we kept your kneecap. And I'm just like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> If they didn't keep my kneecap, you know, I'll still be going through the same thing, I think, right? But, um, so it was very jargony for me. It was very, everything medical and no one actually dealt with the, the mental part of it. I, when, I, when I was going through my process, I was offered six weeks of counselling and that did nothing. That did absolutely nothing. For one, I didn't connect with the counsellor. And for me, it's all about energy. It's all about a connection with somebody, especially in that type of role. Um, so six weeks just wasn't even, I couldn't even touch on the basics. So, um, so yeah, physically I was in a lot of pain. Um, the medication was making me put on weight. Um, I know there's a stereotype as well that when you've got cancer, you lose weight. I was the complete opposite. I put on weight and um, that made me feel even worse. Um, later on in recovery, going when I started venturing out, um, one of the things within the Caribbean community is we have a thing about commenting on how people look. You know, Charlene, you put on a lot of weight. You know, automatically, you don't know what I've gone through, what I am going through. Actually, you don't know anything. But, you know, the first thing that's come to mind is, Charlene, you've put on weight. And again, that will put me back into isolation because I don't want to talk about it. Obviously, I'm not looking the way I would usually look. Um, so, you know, that would put me back five steps. So um, anyway, um, I think after some time, I felt like, the medication was getting too much. Um, it was killing me inside. Um, my son just, I just couldn't bear him seeing me the way I looked. And I realized that I needed to take action. This wasn't me. Um, so what I'd done, I weaned myself off the medication. 
by myself. Um, I'm not advocating that you do that. Um, but again, I felt isolated. I felt like I couldn't talk to um, anybody. Um, so I weaned myself off. I felt much better. I consulted with a Chinese herbal doctor um, who was able to kind of build back my immune system again. Um, so I started feeling better. And um, that was amazing to me. I, I, start, I think I went to Stanmore for a week. Um, they do like this amazing rehabilitation course where you live. Um, you literally live in on campus with other people going through different types of rehabilitation and you go um, you work with closely with the physios you go to um, hydro hydro pool you go to the gym and that done the world for me oh my goodness um, that totally helped my my confidence it helped with issues with my scarring because um, at the time I never I couldn't feel um, it took me about two and a half years to actually feel my skin. So they done a lot of um, skin testing type of, um, I don't know what they call it, but it's just different types of materials. Mm -hmm. And they, you've got to pull it on your, your scarring um, different times of the day. And it kind of helps the feeling come back, which was amazing. And um, they, that team there are just amazing. They um, they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing, and I, that gave me a new lease of life. And um, I was ready to kind of fight back, gain control. And um, at this time, actually, I I did hear about Bone Cancer Research Trust. I know in my mind that I would be working with them, but I just felt like. Um, I couldn't talk again I still felt like I couldn't give myself to to share in my story I wasn't at that place yet but I was I was kind of on my way um so yeah I yeah so what I done I, I kind of um got myself back slowly and it kind of took me seven years to share my story and I had a conversation one day last year, was it the year before, about two years ago, I had a conversation with a close friend of mine, Leanne Pirro, and I found out she had cancer on Facebook. And then I reached out saying, oh my God, I, I had cancer too, haven't told anyone. So she was like, oh my goodness. Met up with her that week. She's like, oh my goodness, Charlene, this is what I'm doing and I want you to be a part of it. And I, I couldn't believe myself. I actually was like, yes, I'm doing this. And um, when I tell you, it's been an amazing experience just to even talk about bone cancer, share my story with bone cancer. And I made, I said to Leanne, I said, I'm gonna, for bone cancer, I want to, because when I went through the process, I think, if I had a network of people, of patients going through the same thing, it would have definitely helped me. And I didn't have that. I mean, technology wasn't the way it was when I was diagnosed. It wasn't like all virtual as much. So um, I think that I would have really benefited from speaking to people that were going through the same thing. And I'm a black person going through bank um, bone cancer and it's like I don't see anyone that looks like me that's going through it as well so again I kind of held back but I feel like the team when I did eventually reach out to the team they were amazing you know it wasn't even about color at that point it's just just like they've embraced me so much and I said to myself and Leanne you know what I'm on a quest but I'm not going to tell anyone. I want to find everyone that's got bone cancer. <laughs> Who told me to say that out loud? I just, once I released my story on Bone Cancer Research Trust, all hell broke loose on social media. So, um, which was amazing. They found me. 
So I'm being contacted by people all over around the world with bone cancer, parents with kids that have got bone cancer, just asking for advice and, you know, how do I feel? How did I get through this? And, you know, and it's it's been amazing. Um, so that was, that's one of the greater things that have come out of this. But um, I would say, though, um, going through... Going through rare, rare cancer as a black person, um, I would say I've had a lot of negatives in terms of, for one, it's actually rare. Um, I got comments like, black people don't have bone cancer, you know, and it's just really, and obviously I'm going through my moment um, and that's so damaging to even say that to somebody. It's, it's just, it's crazy. Um, just things like the chemotherapy part of things. Why are you trying to take away that from me? Because I've had no chemo, I'm okay. I got a lot of, um, oh, you've had a knee replacement. That's fine. You're okay now. No, I'm not okay. You know, I've got tons of mobility issues i mean a lot of people see me and they're like oh my god charlie you look so well or you know when i'm out and about on the train people are looking at me like okay why is she going up the stairs so slow you know like oh this is a lot of commenting like huffing and puffing and it's like you don't even know the mental capacity is taking me to even see those stairs and be like oh my goodness stairs you know, it's um, it's a daily thing with mobility, and I feel like um, again because of how I look, not so much colour, but how I look, I think people feel like, oh, she's all right. You know, she's had the bone cancer, she's had a knee operation, everything's all right, and no, it's not. It's it's far from that. Um, I've had mo, I've got multiple chronic conditions because of it. My immune system has never recovered you know and um last year the whole of last year i had to battle with pneumonia so these are the little things that people don't actually see all these invisible illnesses that it's created um and i'm still having to go to hospital i still feel like i'm under hospital care and you know it's um it could be worse but i'm just I'm at a point now, it's just that people judging all the time. They've got something to say, um, especially within our community. You know, um, one of the things I didn't share was um, a lot of the times people will say what happens at home should stay at home. And that's very well known in the Caribbean community. You're not to tell people what you're going through. That's a no-no. So last year when i appeared on itv news i was actually in jamaica and my mom called me actually no sorry she was in jamaica and she was calling me saying oh my god charlene so much people was calling me because they didn't know about you no they didn't because um you know again this in our community we don't speak out loud we don't share what we're going through it's almost like a sign of weakness um so yeah it was it, you know it's one thing to go through a cancer it's another thing to go through it when when it's been a rare one as well as all the other things that you're having to deal with culturally um at the time going through my cancer i was unable to take my son to school and um in the end long story short i was being taken to court the school knew that I didn't have the ability to bring my son to school and my support system, even though I had a great one, um, trying to get him to school was a nightmare. So instead of them kind of helping me, they wanted to take me to court. Now, this is another thing I'm having to deal with whilst going through treatment and trying to re rehabilitate and I'm going through depression. So um, I had to deal with this with my son in the school. In the end, I had a very, I've got a very close solicitor friend that had to come out of London to come meet with that school. And you know, the head teacher didn't even turn up. 
you know, and you guys are putting me through all of this and there's no support system in place. I think the only thing they mentioned to me was reporting me to social services. Now, to me, you know, social services, I'm not saying that they don't do a great job in what they do at times, but I felt like from my experience, it wasn't a social services matter. Um, it wasn't discussed with me, you know, it just, it, it just got out of um, control. And again, I'm going through all of this. So I decided to take him out of school and put him in a new one. So um, a lot of people don't know this part of the story. And there was just so much going on. And, you know, from I was 16, from I left school, I've always worked. And this is the first time I'm actually on the benefit system, which, again, this was quite depressing for me because I'm used to my independence and sitting down and relying on the government is not my thing. So, but obviously medically, I, you know, I couldn't, I had to do it. Um, so again, I was taken to a tribunal because in the paperwork, they had put, I've had a knee problem and that I need to return to work. They failed to mention I had bone cancer. They failed to mention I couldn't walk. They failed to mention my mobility. Um, they failed to mention everything, all the crucial details that you would when you're referring someone um, within that type of system. So I, I had to go to court. I stood in front of three judges, cried my eyes out. They were just like, what are you doing here? Because we don't understand what you're doing here, why you've been put through this, going through this, and it's a waste of taxpayers' money also, you know? And I'm so glad I didn't have to. I mean, I told them my story very shortly, very short, but I'm just um, grateful that they just dealt with me very quickly because, again, another process I had to go through without getting no type of mental support, support with my child. Bear in mind, I'm in my 20s. Um, everything had been cut off, my social life, everything. Um, so again, it was just, it was a lack of support in all areas. And um, I just, even today, my mum's just like, I don't know how you, I don't know how you go. I don't know how you go on. But again, you know, I need, um, I do need counselling. I still need counselling because it's very traumatic. You know, um, I did, I did start my counselling before um, COVID. But obviously that was kind of cut short. But again, I just feel like if I had known about Bone Cancer Trust a little earlier, if someone reached out to them, maybe on my behalf, because at the time I wasn't able, um, and that could have been friends or family, that could have been um, anyone really, I wouldn't have minded them um even contacting me you know like when you're diagnosed and then whatever cancer it is like kind of like on their database and then they kind of contact you or your next of kin i think maybe that could have been a suggestion but um i'm here it could have been worse um i just feel like i i'm going through this for a purpose and to just try and raise awareness literally to anybody that is going through any type of cancer but obviously bone cancer in particular that you know what reach out i would say um ignore ignore any kind of cultural taboos um it could go against what you're feeling and just reach out because i feel like if i had reached out a lot sooner i wouldn't be in so much um turmoil um i would have got the more support that i needed um so yeah I'm, I'm just here trying to raise awareness and you know doing all that i can to kind of help other cancer survivors also um so they don't have to go through what i went through and still going through you know um so yes thank you so much for listening
and um yeah that's all that's all i can say oh thank you so much that was just <laughs> wonderful um that really really great thank you so much for that charlene thank you for being so honest and talking about you know things which have obviously caused you a lot of pain in the past um now we've got uh, nick kalita yes. to ask you a question if i could hand over to you nick Oh, hi. Hi, Charlene. Thank you very much for such a sort of honest and unsparing account. Hi. It's not easy. Um, I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> what sort of medication were you taking after the uh, operation, operations, and uh, what sort of doses? Do you happen to recall? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. I was on two types of morphines. Um, mm. I had, I was on the slow, slow release, which I think was, I don't know. I can't remember. One was in a liquid form. One was in a tablet. Um, I can't remember the dosage of everything, to be honest. It was a lot of medication, but I do, mm. I do have a list of it here with me though. Um, I was on sleeping tablets. I had anxiety. I couldn't sleep. Wow. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it was a lot of medication, a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad and you winged yourself off And infections them. also, yes, yes. Yes. It's a good thing, taking these things long term really is not good physically or mentally. So well done, well done. Thank you so much, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've also got Phil Kay who'd like to ask you a question as well, Charlene. Over to you, Phil, you just have to unmute yourself. Hi, Charlene. I, uh, yeah, thank you. I really, I really enjoyed that. It was, um, it was really informative. It's uh, very, very interesting. I, I was um, a couple of things really. One, one was I, I don't know how much time you spent in the war, but um, for me, in um, the nine months that we were on the war, um, the, the war itself was a, a melting pot of races faiths different cultures um and everybody was thrown together and cancer made things it was such a commonality everybody just hugged everybody else whatever color where they were whatever culture they came from whatever faith um and, and I, I saw no stigma at all uh, we were at leeds lgi um and it was um one of the wonderful parts of the the horror that that you go through, what for me was that 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 total inclusion. You know, it's as you hoped the world would be. Um, but what, what I wanted to ask you, um, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't mean to waffle on there. I used to, um, I, I worked in mental health for ten years, and um, you you touched on your uh, mental health yourself kindly, and um, the one defining constant in a diagnosis of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, which is, um, sadly, it's been hijacked by the military now. People think nowadays, if you've got PTSD, you've probably been blown up. But in actual fact, anybody, the one defining point that, that makes you susceptible to PTSD is if at some stage in your life, you feel you may die, if you feel your life threatened. And I'm just wondering if anybody's discussed that with you and uh in, in your counseling sessions and so on no nothing nothing like that was ever discussed with me um i've tried over the years i've had to learn myself what my triggers are and my triggers are is when when someone dies especially when it's cancer mm. near near like close to me um my triggers are also is when I'm not well and I'm in bed and can't go out. Again, it brings back the same type of feeling like, oh, my goodness, here we go again. And um, that gets me into a depressive mode. Um, sometimes my triggers are when people reach out to me. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm all about supporting and helping others. But then again, the groundwork hasn't really been done with myself. So again, it's another trigger um, 
when people reach out um but no no one's ever discussed that with me um i know i know i do suffer from depression i know it's not all the time but again when i'm going through these type of triggers i go into a little depression it sometimes it lasts for a week a few days um some is quite hard to get out of um i know my sister i speak to one of my sisters every day and she, i don't think she realized what she actually does because we we you know girls we kind of waffle on about things all the time she actually does help my mind kind of off things a lot of the time so um that helps me um but yeah no definitely um mental health after a diagnosis you know it, it needs to be um it needs to be addressed um six weeks of counseling is not good enough you know it's not good enough no no i think the um i think the way the system's arranged isn't good mm. enough i think um because you this you sort of on oncology ward you you treat for um a cancer and when the cancer's gone they think that's it we've done our job yeah so, done and dusted yeah. and um and and if, if you have mental health problems afterwards you're expected to go through your GP for a referral, perhaps to a mental health team or something like that. But you know, um, you've been incredibly brave. But then talking is fantastic. Obviously, you have somebody you trust that you can talk to. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful thing. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of um, meditating. I do a lot of that type of stuff, just trying to relax um to just try and help my mind and just kind of i've got a lot of things that go that's going on anyway so it's like sometimes i just need to just put down the phone for the weekend and you know just get away from it all We lost the connection there a bit. Oh. Yeah. If we just give it a minute. Oh, she's there. She's there. Yeah. Charlene, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for that question, Phil. Um, we've also got another question from Valerie Harden, Charlene. Valerie, if you'd like to ask your question. Hi, Charlene. Um, thank you very much for that talk. It was fantastic. It's Yeah, I can hear you. Val, can you can you start again? I think your connection cut out. I might have lost Val. Right, I can I can ask um, Valerie's question. I'll just yeah. find it. Hang on. Um, Yeah, Valerie was going to ask you, in terms of a cultural taboo, was it ever suggested that you should not have your surgery, that you should just accept your punishment and just not do anything to treat the cancer? No, okay. personally, no. Um, no, it wasn't actually. Um, yeah, funny enough, it wasn't. It actually wasn't. Okay. um yeah i didn't get that side of it i really didn't um but i i knew in my mind that i had to do it is if i don't i'm gonna lose my leg and it's gonna spread so um i i had made my mind up anyway that i had to have surgery um what what um i think whilst going through my the process of them explaining what's going to happen to you um i wasn't i wasn't questioning because i wasn't in the right state of mind to question okay what's going to happen next or i just wasn't i wasn't there mm. um you know so yeah no that was never that was nothing nothing that came up for me that didn't come up for me no 
Okay. I think Val's back, actually. Val, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? Yes, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> dropped out. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you, I, I thanked you, Charlene, so hopefully you heard that uh, for your talk, because oh. you know, it did resonate with me. A couple of things. Firstly, you know, you did mention about, you know, not telling anyone. It's typical in the, you know, black community, not telling anyone. How did you find that? Did you actually, um, I think you kind of said you sort of pushed back against that. Yeah, I didn't tell anyone because I feel like um, the first reaction was kind of negative. Um, I chose not to tell anyone because I just felt, I felt so ashamed in the terms of my mobility. It's like, this isn't me. I've put on weight. Um, I'm just, I was sick and tired of what people were saying and they didn't even know me. Um, so that, that made right, it worse. Sorry, sorry, Charlene, was that right at the beginning? You were saying, you know, when you were first diagnosed, was that right at the beginning of the diagnosis or later? Yeah, right at the beginning right. where I initially um, got a negative reaction on the first day of my diagnosis that kind of already put my back up to like, oh my goodness, I'm not, I'm not telling nobody else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and but I, for me, as a woman of colour and sort of cultural background, I was actually told not to tell anyone. You know, okay. they don't want, you know, yeah. you know, don't want people knowing your business and that sort of thing. So yeah. you were sort of, you know, so your support um, potentially sort of cut off. Yes, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I mean, um, it's it's a bit tricky. I mean. Mm. Um, no one came out and says, don't say. Right. I think for me, when I did say, I got a negative it's reaction. Yeah. So, and this, these are from my, these are from, um, you know, close people. Yeah. So automatic, it's like, if, if you're dealing with me like this, how is the world going to deal with me if I'm sharing something like this? Mm. So yeah, it was. It's a bit tricky. Oh yeah, it's a bit tricky. I I cut off myself based on the reactions I got. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And you, did you find that you got a lot of support from sort of going ahead with your surgery and that sort of thing? I did. From, from your fa from your I, family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I did. I got a lot of support. Um, a lot of what I'm saying now, they don't know what I was going through. I tried to. I tried to shield them in how I was feeling. Um, I didn't want to tell them exactly how I was feeling. Um, so, so when they were supporting me, you know, I think they kind of thought, "Oh, she's okay," but actually, I wasn't. Mm. But yeah, the support from them was amazing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I think um, sort of culturally older people, because I think I'm a little bit older than you. Um, so generally the older people, they tend to sort of think about cancer um, in the Caribbean uh, culture anyway, as something that you will immediately die from. And it's a shameful thing. And you just keep quiet and you take your punishment. And, you know, they're not even encouraging you to do um the surgery or anything like that did you ever no. anything like that i didn't because um like i said i kept it small i kept my yeah, circle yeah. very small yeah my, so yeah, i think so maybe yeah. maybe if i told everybody mm. i possibly would have got that reaction especially from the older generation yeah and i think it's but because it, i am older that i probably got that yeah yeah, yeah. even though you I, know it I, was a very small you know very close relatives yeah yes yes no I, I kept it very small and um yeah I, I i yeah i probably would have got that to be honest okay thank you very much oh thank you valerie okay thanks for that val um charlene i was just going to ask you what yeah. i think you've answered it somewhat in what you were in your talk but i just wondered what we as a charity for primary bone cancer patients could could do to help somebody like you you know, you said that if you would perhaps reached out to us earlier or somebody else had reached out on your behalf, you wouldn't have suffered as much. I just wonder if there's anything else that we could be doing that would improve, would have improved your experiences? I don't know. I just, um, 
I don't know if I had, you know, the work that you guys do is amazing, but I feel like sometimes when I don't see people like me, when I go onto the bone cancer website, I don't see people like me on there. Um, I'm wondering, okay, is are people that are black or from an ethnic minority that are going through cancer, bone cancer, are they holding back because they don't see somebody like themselves getting support on the website or at the events? Mm. Um, you know, these are the things that I kind of ask myself and you know, I, I try and do as I try and do as much work with you guys as I can. And anything you ask of me, I'm there if I can, because actually I want the ethnic group to kind of see, look, I am black, I have got bone cancer, you know, you guys are supporting me, I'm helping your supporters also come forward. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um I don't know what else can be done to be honest other than you know things like you know your marketing mm. um putting more of the bank community on your marketing um like i said some type of system where i don't know if it will ever be done but you know where someone is contacted if you've been diagnosed with a bone cancer with any cancer i mean you're given your nurse mm. your specialist nurse but then that charity in this like uh it's almost like the charity has to wait for the patient to contact them mm. and i know they've got all this data protection in place and you know I, I don't know um i don't know but i'm definitely open to helping with suggestions <laughs> definitely mm. i don't know we've uh, just had a question from uh ali gartland who's actually one of our trustees um, who said, did the, your CNS, your specialist nurse, not know about BCRT to be able to refer you to us? I don't, you know, it was such a long time ago, to be honest. I know I've seen, I don't actually remember her saying, but I did get the, the pamphlet. I did get the book. Yeah. Um, but in terms of conversation, I don't remember. I don't. And I just, I feel like, they need to be that we need to be urged into it maybe not the patient but close family and friends to be urged into it look please contact this charity they can help her they can help him you know i i don't know i just feel like there's a disconnect in the beginning because when you're actually going through it um you're actually literally going through it i just um i don't know how to kind of bridge that gap well, hopefully we can work together. Yeah, so yeah. Things different, you know, going forward. Exactly. I think there's been discussions in the past about trying to use the charity um, in the hospitals as like a next step. It's almost like yeah. an onward referral after yeah. the point of treatment or surgery concluding, or at least being in hospital, you are then referred on for another type of support and care and actually you know one can argue that that is probably the most crucial point for that to happen um, yeah. yeah i think we're, we're really trying to work on just being better known in the teams and the hospitals and being used as like a, a referral basically and a yeah. contact yeah. i think that's very important mm. i i yeah. wanted to ask something um if there wasn't another question at the moment um, so I listened to a talk um, given by actually someone that you know, Jenny. So Jenny also works with Black Women Rising and Jenny talked about the perceptions of the GP and the hospital doctors basically in what they're saying is, is all truth. You will never question it. Culturally, you are taught to say, okay if a doctor saying to you there's nothing wrong with you then you take it and you say okay that's fine and then you leave and i just wondered if you had had any experiences or any comments on that sort of thing being with the gp and them saying to you it seems like everything is fine i mean you, you've said that actually your referral seemed to be quite quick to the bone cancer center but i don't know if you've heard of any other 
kind of women or any other cancer patients in Black Women Rising who have had a similar experience with a GP or a doctor? Yeah, I mean, um, personally, my um, GP has been amazing. Um, I got seen to very quickly and um, that is very unheard of, actually. A lot of the cases I hear in in Black Women Rising and other cancer support groups, it hasn't been the same. Um, they've had to go back. Some people have even had to change GPs um, because they're not listening, you know. And you know your body um, better than anybody else. And when you've come to them, it's quite... Um, it's horrible. It's so horrible um, being turned away and being made to feel like, oh, it's just you again kind of thing. When actually you found out later on, no, actually I was, it was a cancer and I've been to you how many times and you guys have just turned me away again. Um, I hear about it all the time. Um, but again, I'm, I'm just so blessed that I didn't have to go through that. Um, what I do find is that a lot of the time they want to just fuel you with more medication and um you know especially when your mental health isn't right and the side effects of all the medications you're currently using they're plowing you with more and i, I for me you know like right now if i've got a problem i'm quite hesitant actually to go to the doctor gp because I don't want more medication. Um, so I find with me, again, the medication side of things, they just want to give me all the time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I didn't go through what what others have been through in that sense with the GPs. Um, no. no. It was sort of an interesting comment that she, she mentioned. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about, I hadn't even kind of recognised that myself. Mm. Um, um, I think Phil's just got another question for you, Charlene, if that's okay. That's fine. Hi again, Charlene. Hi, yeah. Um, I hear you're looking lovely. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there were other um, coloured people um, going through... Um, Probably you'd meet on the ward or in clinic, maybe with a different type of cancer, but other coloured people going through um, the cancer experience itself, never mind the, the bone cancer, but the whole sort of cancer crap, you know, and um, did, did, did you meet many people like that? And, and if you did, was it a source of help and support? I never met no one, um, no black people in hospital I never saw any black nurses black doctors or anything like that while I was in hospital um, I've met a lot of people as time's gone on a lot of people feel in the support groups with different cancers and um, their their issues were things like um, there was no black wigs no. Now you've lost your hair and there's no yeah. black wigs on the NHS. Wow. And th this really struck a chord with me. I know I didn't go through that, but I done a talk last year. I shared the stage with, um, oh gosh, the, the chief executive of NHS. And I just totally went off script and was like, why is there no wigs for black people in hospital going through chemotherapy? It's ridiculous, yeah. you know, and people are going through cancer having to go and buy their own wigs yeah. because there's none, none there. It's all sold out, Very you know, and I'm just like, really? This is crazy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are facing, um, they're facing so much different issues, you know, not only just going through a particular cancer, but it's just so much other things on top that um they just they actually don't need to be going through this you know yeah for sure yeah. thank you what was his answer charlene when you were asking <laughs> that question i never got a response the, the host was looking at me like oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> it's such a 
a valid point, isn't it? It's such a valid point. And, you know, maybe the same sort of thing with like the look good, feel better sessions. I mean, I know they are very inclusive and they're very good, but is there makeup for every skin, single skin colour? Or, you know, is there yeah. that sort of thing? It's, it's just... Yeah. And I find that those type of events, I mean, those cancer events are really nice. But then sometimes I find for me, they don't have my size. They don't have a size 16. Yeah. Like, you know, this is meant to be a feel good cancer event where we get free clothes and meet other cancer patients and you've got size eights and tens on the rails. Mm. It's like, okay, but you still haven't catered for yeah. us in that type of way. So I don't know, the list goes on, doesn't it? It's no. almost just like it hasn't been thought through properly. No. Which just needs no. to really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I don't think we have any more questions. Philip has just asked a question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go on. Philip, did you want to ask it yourself or do you like us to read it? Um, no, I'm happy to ask. Thank you so uh, much for sharing today. And hi, everyone. Um, I, I did some local work uh, with, a, with a charity that gives uh, free counselling sessions uh, to anybody affected by cancer or any terminal illness and as part of that they used to have these moving on days that were mainly for breast cancer survivors and uh, basically what they invited was um, everybody that had been discharged so um, they, obviously they were still being monitored but um, they weren't attending clinics um, um, as you do when, when you are going through treatment uh, so the people that had been discharged in the last 12 months and there was a day that survivors could come along and um, they would have talks about physios and at the survivor point um, and also from nurses things to look out for or, or, or any kind of um, uh, uh, advice they could give and they did talk about PTSD, they talked about um, uh, you know CRPS or, or problems with the back or uh, or your shoulders if, if you are relying on a, on a on a walking stick on walking aid like many of us do and I think it would be really kind of healing because at least we would have something and if nothing else it will provide us with a network of people they're more or less at the same point of our journey because sometimes you know you look back and you go there there you're survivor um, it's easy for me to say uh, mm -hmm. because I'm here now and and you know eventually for as much as we all come up, come out of this traumatized we do forget how tough it is at, at that point in time even though we do remember it and live with it uh, so I'm just wondering if it was something that people would be interested in developing I don't know it's just an idea no, it's a really, really good idea and it's something that Louise and I can look into. I think it's an amazing idea, actually. And I like the idea of it being moving on rather than, you know, anything else. It's, you are moving on, but there are other types of support there for you. I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, it was a great, great point. Sorry for overlooking your question. It's a good job Louise was a bit more eagle-eyed than I was. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I think I think that is that that's it now for questions. So um, all I want to say is a massive, massive thank you, to Charlene. Um, oh. you, re you really are amazing. I bet you don't feel like you are, but to me, I think you're inspirational and a truly wonderful person. Um, so thank you very, very much for for doing this webinar. Um, the details of our next webinar they're on the website, but it's going to be on the 10th of September. And it's with Monica uh, Shetnika, who's a specialist dietitian, who will be talking to us about the importance of nutrition and diet whilst going through cancer treatments and after as well. So that should be really interesting. Um, I just want to say as well, if anyone had any questions for Charlene or anything that they wanted to put to her afterwards that you think of, you can just drop us an email um, and we can liaise with Charlene and, and do that for you. Yeah, of course. Good point, Lou. Um, so thank you once again, Charlene. Oh, um, thank hopefully, you. Hopefully be working again with you very soon. Yeah, yes. well done. Bye. Thank you for having me. See you later, Bye, everyone. Thank you.